Hello, my name is Mary Ellen Barrett, and I'm the editor of Seton Magazine, which is put out by Seton Home Study School. I am a columnist for the Long Island Catholic here in New York, and I have been a homeschooling mother for about 20 years. My oldest child is 26, and then I have a 24, 22, 19, 18, two 15-year-olds and a 12-year-old. So I've been at this mothering thing a long time. It's starting to feel a little old. Right now, today, I want to talk to you a little bit about a subject that is really passionate for me. Um, since I became a mother and wanted so much to raise my children in the Catholic faith and to really bind them to that faith, I started reading and exploring the idea of living the liturgical year. Now, that's not something I grew up doing. Um, we celebrated Christmas, we celebrated Easter, we went to Mass every Sunday, we did all those Catholic things, but we didn't actually live a liturgical life. Um, and I don't know that that was such a thing then. I was, I was kind of raised in the 70s, and here in the United States, um, we're kind of considered the most poorly catechized generation. And I didn't want that for my children. I wanted them to learn to love their Catholic faith really deeply and to have it be part of their lives constantly for the rest of their lives. I really wanted to bind them to that. And so when my children were younger, I kind of explored this idea of living a liturgical life. And what I wanted to, the goal for that, I guess, was for them to be joyful in their faith, to not just um, view Catholicism as a bunch of rules and regulations, which is kind of the way it's portrayed in the media, at least here. So I wanted them to feel the joy that Christ brings with him um, and to feel the love all the time and to feel the freedom that these rules and regulations, if you want to put it that way, bring with them. The freedom to live a good and faithful life le leading your way to heaven, I guess. I wanted my children to be in heaven and I thought this would be the best way to do it is to kind of um, explore the rhythms of the church within my home. So having researched that a little bit, I came up with the phrase, I came across the phrase, I didn't come up with it. Um, I came across the phrase, the domestic church. So let me just read to you this beautiful quote from Pope St. John Paul II. Um, Catholic parents must learn to form their family as a domestic church, a church in the home, as it were, where God is honored, his law is respected, Prayer is a normal event, virtue is transmitted by word and example, and everyone shares the hopes, the problems, and sufferings of everyone else. All this is not to advocate a return to some outdated style of living. It is to return to the roots of human development and human happiness. So isn't that an extraordinary idea that we are, when we live within our domestic church, a liturgical life, when we put God first, we're returning to way, the way God intended it to be, the roots of human development. He never wanted for us to be separate from him. He wanted us to be joyful and to live a beautiful, happy life with him and to someday meet him in heaven. So I just thought that that was such a profound idea, this domestic church, where you live the church's life in your house. So, having thought about that a long time and, and written about it, I decided we have to kind of do it. So, what does living a liturgical life mean? Well, it's following the rhythms of the church, really. And it doesn't mean we all dress in purple in um, Advent and Lent and we don't dress in green the rest of the time. Although I've known people who've done that. Um, and I could never absolutely pull that off. I have a lot of daughters and they just decide how they're going to dress. <laughs> but... What we did do was start picking out little places where we could celebrate the church's liturgical year and create traditions. So what I would really advise to families who want to kind of share this love and this joy of Christ in their homes is to start establishing traditions. As we know as Catholics, tradition is really important and it's doubly important within the context of your family, because outside of your family, outside of your home, outside of your domestic church, the world is trying to tear apart things like family and tradition and faith. And so if you really have a solid background in your family culture of tradition, of um, blessings like that in your house, 
then your children will pass that on to their children and their grandchildren. And this will continue years and years beyond us being here. And it will perpetuate our faith and it will create a culture where Catholicism thrives. And that's what we want, right? That's what, what we are really doing as parents is um, teaching your kids to say please and thank you and teaching your kids, helping them with their math homework and, and teaching them all these other things. These are incredibly important things and I don't want to minimize any of that. But teaching them their Catholic faith and binding them to that faith and creating an atmosphere in your house where this is just what we do. We are Catholics. This is how we live. We are set apart people. This is why we do this. That is the goal. And once you do that, once you have those rhythms and those traditions established in your house, oh my goodness, the joy, the happiness, it's just all the time, you know? Um, so in my house, what we first did, um, because the Catholic Church, if Catholic meaning universal, is all over, um, and you have traditions um, that are kind of connected to your heritage. So for example, in my house, um, we're Irish. I have many Irish, my grandparents are from Ireland. I have many relatives in Ireland. And we kind of live an Irish American life, which is, you know, a thing. It really is a thing here, especially on the East Coast where I live in New York. Um, so exploring saints and, and traditions that reflect my heritage was really important to me for my um, to, to pass down to my children, not just because um, Ireland is a beautiful part of our our heritage and our lives, even now with Irish relatives and going back to visit them and they come here and all that kind of stuff, um, but because it's such a beautiful country, a faith, well, it used to be a very faith-filled country, and I wanted my children to know that. So, of course, here in, um, in New York, the obvious thing to start with was St. Patrick's Day because that's a huge celebration here. But I wanted it to be more about, more than about the parade and those kinds of things. I wanted it to be them knowing what St. Patrick did. And by the way, he wasn't even Irish, he was Roman. <laughs> but he converted the Irish people. And that was important for me to, for them to know that he wasn't just a saint who, who we celebrate because, you know, all things Irish are fun and it's green and there's beer and there's um, there's soda bread and all these kinds of things. But because he literally converted a nation, he changed the world that way. So we read when they were younger, I had many picture books about St. Patrick. And yes, I would bake soda bread and we would we would discuss the, how he explained the Trinity, the legend um, with using the shamrock, the three the three leaves on the one plant or the Trinity. Um, and they still, you know, in, in their twenties, they talk about those discussions and those, and they still have favorite picture books, which they will pull off the shelf because it's a, a shelf in the living room and look at at St. Patrick's Day. Sometimes I just kind of leave them around. We would um, do little crafty things. I'm not particularly crafty, um, but we would do little things like that. Um, also important to us was St. Bridget's Day because I have a Bridget and St. Kevin's Day because I have a Kevin. Um, most of my kids, all of my kids actually have Irish names. So that was really important. And another way that we would celebrate and I would take the liturgical year and bring it home is in Advent. Now we're in Advent now. Um, so I would pick two or three feast days within Advent to celebrate with the kids and kind of anticipate the coming of Christ by bringing this joy and this anticipation and this excitement through our celebration of these particular feast days and kind of incorporating them with our American Christmas traditions, which are fun. You know, there's no reason not to do things um, just because they don't necessarily scream Catholicism or scream liturgical year. But I would try to con um, connect the two. For example, uh, December 4th is the Feast of St. Barbara who is the patroness of the artillery, the army, um, not the army, but the artillery, and also of architects because um, legend had it that her father locked her in a tower. Um, it's, it's a beautiful story. So she was the pat patroness of architects. So on December 4th, I would read them the story of St. Barbara and we would make our gingerbread houses because you're constructing a little house. Um, and I would make it very simple, graham crackers and frosting and stuff like that. We are not the kind of people who decorate the huge, beautiful gingerbread house. It's just, you know, again, not crafty. Don't do that. Um, so that would be one way. And then Our Lady of Guadalupe and the Feast of St. Juan Diego in um, December, I think it's the 9th and the 12th. 
Um, we would have tacos. We would read um, some beautiful stories about them. There are some beautiful picture books. Um, one year, in, and this is, I um, took pictures and it was in the Seton Magazine at one point. Um, we made a big tilma out of brown paper. One of my daughters painted the, uh, the Blessed Mother on the tilma. She's talented that way. Um, and then they wore tilmas around the house for the day and that was kind of cute. So they, but now they know very much how um, St. Juan Diego and the Blessed Mother converted Mexico to Catholicism. And that's an incredibly important story aside from eating Mexican food and, and crafting tilmas and things like that. The fact that these, this prayerful, faithful peasant man just loved God and loved the Blessed Mother so much that he just stepped out in faith and did what he was asked and didn't hesitate. That's the message, okay? Because we're all going to be called out, I think, at some point to do that in our lives, to just step out in faith and try to do God's will. So these, when you're reading the story to a six or seven-year-old, that's not the message they're necessarily getting, but they will kind of mull over that in their heads. And if you do it consistently enough with these different stories and these different traditions, then it just becomes second nature. Oh yes, God's will for me. I need to explore that. I need to pray about it. I need to know what it is before I make these decisions, before I do these things. Another way to um, to really celebrate your, your liturgical year and to, to really spark some joy into your um, into your home, into your domestic church, is to celebrate their name days, the children's name days, if there's a patron saint, or their baptism day, when they actually became who they were in the Catholic Church. You know, they, they received the Holy Spirit. So we would I would take out the, um, the baptism candle that they received on that day, if it hasn't like melted in the attic or something, which has happened to me, but you can buy an extra one. And we would have a little cake and, and light their baptism candle and is singing the birthday song except happy baptism day to you and things like that when they're small children they really really appreciate that kind of fuss because it's their birth in christ their baptism right so a birthday and a baptism day are completely worth celebrating as separate entities because they're two separate very separate events obviously but their baptism in christ is just as important as their birth into the world because now they're they're being born into eternal salvation, hopefully. So we make that point. And we still do that with the older kids. They still like to celebrate their baptism day. A little celebration, it doesn't have to be much. A candle and a cupcake, right, is a lot of fun. But before I let you go, because I don't wanna run over time, I do wanna make the, um, the point that however you choose to live in your domestic church, whatever traditions that you decide are important for your family, it is actually really important not to overwhelm yourself, not to take on too much, not to think you have to do crafts. Doing crafts does not make you a better mother. Not doing crafts does not make you a bad mother. Like I said, I am not crafty. If a craft happened to fall out of the sky and somebody said, here, do this, I can do it, but I can't think things up. There are tons of resources for that kind of thing, but if you don't have to do that, reading the picture books, telling the stories, um, going to church and praying, asking a priest to tell the story of the Saint Day, or um, I, we often would have priests come over for dinner and they would explain things to the children. It can be just as simple as that. So you don't have to make a huge fuss, but marking these days and paying attention to the liturgical year will bind your children to their faith, will create this atmosphere in your house of the great joy that God is giving us, not only because he's giving us the opportunity to be with him in heaven, but because he gave us this family, he gave us these children. He planned time out of mind before the earth was formed, he planned this family for you. And how extraordinary is that, the trust that's involved and all he wants for us is to love him and to love each other and to just exude that joy that he always, always planned for us. And I think as parents, we have such an opportunity to create that joy all the time in our homes with our children, with our, with our parents and our grandparents and all of these people who are in and out of our houses, friends. Um, we can exude that joy simply by paying attention to the fact that we are a domestic church. As Pope John Paul II so wisely said, that we are the people who are going to create the next generation of Catholics and that we are going to 
be part of this salvation history for all of these people. And that is an extraordinary gift and it's a joyful one. So I encourage you to sit down. We have a new year coming up and think about ways that you can celebrate your Catholic faith, your heritage, your family traditions, and think of little ways that you can create this atmosphere of joy in your house with your children, with the love of God, his blessed mother, St. Joseph, all the angels and saints, they will help you to create the joy that is yours. It is yours there for the taking. Thank you so much for your time and attention here, and I wish you a wonderful, wonderful Advent and a very Merry Christmas.